You're tuning in to the Investors of Change with your hosts, Riz Fizz and The Big Lebowski. For more insights on content similar to this video, feel free to subscribe on YouTube or follow on Twitter. The views on this video are opinion shared and not investment advice. Remember to do your own due diligence. Hey, Jacob, good to see you. Um, that was a pretty brutal quarter, but we're still going to cover it and uh, let everyone know what's going on with the company and, and give some of our takeaways. How are you doing? Oh, uh, uh, good. Uh, a hectic day. Um, just got back home from from swimming with the kids, but really brutal to see uh, to see the the earnings uh, the earnings call and just so much so much to talk about, so much to cover on on this talk today, Adam. Yeah, so what we're talking about is uh, Good Food reported their Q4 earnings today. I think the stock uh, is cl has closed down about 25% uh, for the day. So yeah, we're, we're not having the, the best day, but uh, um, still lots to talk about. And it was a pretty interesting quarter because it seems like the company is taking some pivots. Definitely. And Adam, um, let's dig right into it. Will you take us through for this call? We have, uh, similar to previously, we have uh, each made our three uh, key takeaways um, and then put them together and we will just share them with, uh, with the viewer. Will you go ahead with your first uh, key point? Yeah. So uh, like it says here, the active subscribers at the end of the period were down both year over year and quarter over quarter. And it's actually not a very pretty picture. I, I think that at the end of the previous quarter, they, they had about uh, 317,000 active subscribers. And now it's down to about uh, 249,000 act active subscribers. And that would be customers who made at least one order within the, uh, within the uh, one order within the period. Um, and yeah, the CFO did say that they have since seen a rebound in active customer growth, but they do expect choppiness because it is hard for them to give estimates of this kind of post pandemic uh, landscape. And what did you have for your first key, key takeaway? Yeah, exactly. I was also really focused about when we're talking about top line, you took it from a active subscriber point of view. I took it from the net sales being a minus 5% quarter over quarter. Um, it, the, the quarter results, like they always are in, in food, the, the Q4 is usually a weak quarter because that's across the summer, that, that's fine, but the, with the further amplification of the, of the reopening of the Canadian economy, um, especially comparing to Q4 2020, where the country was under uh, lockdown restrictions. Um, and I like your quote as well. I, we, we also saw an analyst um, asking in the in the Q&A part of the of the earnings call where he where he talked to Jonathan Reuter about um, this point you have here to clarify what how is it that he views the outlook for Q2 um, in, in uh, oh sorry Q1 in the new in the new 2022 fiscal year and that's exactly where he still points out this uh, choppiness uh, going forward. Yeah. And, and I've actually, um, if we want to go back for a second, like I've actually kind of broken out some of the stats for um, the sales versus the active customers. So um, if you look at like how much an average active customer spent this quarter, it was about 300, just under $320 coming in at like $318 per active subscriber for the quarter. Um, last quarter, which is like their highest record ever quarter for revenue, um, and the highest ever uh, active subscribers, they were spending on average about $340 a quarter. Mm. So it's about $20 less per quarter for uh, per subscriber. But if you look at comparisons with last year, they're actually up about $20 um, per active subscriber from last year. However, the actual subs are down. So they ended last, uh, they ended Q4 last year with 200 and and 80,000 subscribers, and now down to uh, 249,000. And of course, that's COVID comps versus, you know, reopening and, and summer months as well. But still not what you what you want to see. Yeah, good, good point, Adam. Exactly. And I think 
the the top line also to elaborate a little bit that that's um, that that's going going and not coming out so strong was also like it it didn't seem like a great surprise we we talked about this previously that um, when looking at Alexa ranking and and uh, and sources for traffic that was incoming it it looked to be that um, that they would be challenged on on the top line so um, I don't think yeah, there was a yeah. great surprise there yeah the one benefit is that the subscribers that they that um, you know have remained are, are a little bit more engaged than they were a year ago, but you still want to see the number of active subs move up, uh, hopefully in the, in the coming quarters. Yeah, definitely. And let's move on, Adam, directly to your second point. Could you walk us through that? Yeah. So these are probably the most expected ones, and probably you know what every uh, company is facing right now. Um, but there's obvious headwinds right now. There's reopening, there's seasonality, there's labor shortages, inflation, and increased uh, packaging costs. So the gross margins fell um, from around 35% last quarter to, I think, 20, 22%. So uh, gross margins are, are down by a lot, but they do expect them to um, trend more in line with their long-term objectives after Q1. Exactly. And Adam, um, straight up, I'm also laser focused on the gross margins. It was a jawbreaker to see it come in 10 percentage points uh, on the drop year over year. Um, Reuter mentioned uh, the CFO four points for this, uh, exactly this, uh, the, the, the aspects you, you mentioned there. What I, it's negative, no doubt about it. Uh, what I find comfort in is that they are being called non-structural. They look to be non-structural, and uh, Kagi also under, especially under the the Q Q and A session, also mentioned to an analyst that uh, that there are clear clear levers out there to to correct those. Um, and it was especially, I think, devastating to see because we were so optimistic when we looked at Q three where we were so positively surprised about the gross margins that were rec breaking record high levels. Um, so going back on this um, seemed just like a step back, but also tells us the complexity of how the business model should obtain high uh, gross margins um, and how everything in terms of unit economies and economies of scales have to be in place uh, in order for that uh, to happen and, and what the consequences can be when, they, when they're not there. Yep. And we're going to talk about their pivot next, I think, but I think that is also going to take a toll on their gross margins going forward. And, you know, it, it remains yet to be seen, but should we get into our, our third and final takeaway? Definitely. Adam, what do you have there? Yeah. So uh, they seem to be going uh, pretty heavy into quick commerce. So the company believes uh, that customer convenience and quick commerce will be very important going forward. And the net promoter score, which is kind of how likely a, a customer is to recommend the quick commerce service to a friend or family, is 88, which is very, very strong. They say that it's above the, the, it's the highest actually in the grocery industry. Um, you can think of quick commerce kind of like Uber Eats, Instacart, DoorDash. Um, but yeah, that's this is very new and this is kind of the big pivot that the company the company took. Um, so what was your third and final takeaway, Jacob? Yeah, this was, um, I had like two things. So first of all, there was like the whole PL we talked about before, which really, you couldn't find any comfort in the PL. You were just, oof, this is just a quarter you want to forget. But then the, the focus on this earnings call uh, and, and what our, I think our audience should take away from, from this earnings calls, even more so than the PL, is really this big, big, what seemed like a monumental shift towards uh, quick uh, commerce. Uh, I fully agree that that was that it was also a big part of the Q and A. The analysts seemed a little bit. I don't know how you, how you uh, listened to that part. They also seem a little bit uh, bedaffled. I don't know what the English term is there about where is this focus coming from? How long has it been uh, has it been um, uh, under wrap? Uh, because it really seemed like a fast forward on on this part. From a strategic point of view, um, so so the focus on the micro fulfillment centers with this first one they launched, um, uh, not so uh, or, or uh, not so uh, long ago, 
the big focus on that delivering meal kits and pre prep meals and groceries to end customers should be something that they uh, that they definitely can play on uh, on the quick uh, commerce uh, pa parameters um and and then you could say regarding the regarding the the micro fulfillment centers um it was interesting to hear Kagi elaborate a little bit about the uh, economies on that and how they see it going forward with uh, i think he mentioned a cost of approximately 1 million canadian dollars for setting up one micro fulfillment center and that each one would have a break even point of of 12 months but adam the whole focus about micro fulfillment centers and and the pivot how how did you experience that uh, how did it come in 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 this earnings call yeah um well to me like it wasn't completely unexpected but i don't think that i expected it so soon uh jonathan ferrari has been talking about adding convenience and that's going to be kind of the edge that good food wants to have they want to be able to deliver to people faster um, they see that customer satisfaction is much higher if a customer can get their groceries within two hours. Um, and right now, I think that good on average, these quick commerce orders have been fulfilled within like 36 minutes. So it's like, I'm actually very impressed that they're able to do it so quickly based on how long they've, they've been doing it. And it's currently available to 18 different neighborhoods in Toronto. I'm in Toronto. Unfortunately, my neighborhood uh, is not one of those 18. So I, I hope that they're going to offer it to my area soon so that I can try it out. Um, but yeah, they, I mean, a, a bit of a shock that I think that the news about this one hour delivery, like only came out a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. Um, and, exactly. and yeah, so like, you know, it's, it still hasn't even, like, I don't think the, I don't think shareholders have fully digested the news still, right? Like we, we still could have more volatility um, coming up for, you know, whether it's positive or negative. Well, um, what about Adam? I mean, when I hear this, because the impression of this earnings calls was also when you're talking about a service like this and it being so fundamental for the business, which they emphasize, yeah. you can either come with this out of a position of strength that we are really in a good position now we are doing this or sometimes you can come with it from a position of weakness right like we're struggling we need this to support us going forward how, i don't know if you follow me on that but how did you view this from from management how they presented it because like you said normally this would be something that that was maybe not presented so intensely on an earnings call but something that had it had, had its own light do you know do you follow me on that yeah, yeah, I agree. It's like a, it was almost like a small announcement that they made um, a couple of weeks ago, and then it became kind of like the front and center of the earnings call. And they really seem like they're almost going all in on this quick commerce thing, and they want to mm -hmm. they want to expand it pretty quickly. It's hard to say. I mean, the yeah. the management does think that it opens up like a new twenty five billion dollar TAM that they weren't a part of, so that's good. And like, like they say, the online grocery market is also at such an early stage. Um, you know, this might be something that, that gives them an edge in the long term, because as a customer of good food, the value proposition for getting stuff within 30 minutes is just, you know, unmatched. You don't need to wait around all day, I, you know, I, waiting for like, for, yeah. for, you know, produce and, and meat and stuff to arrive. But at the same time, um, it, you don't know if that was their original plan and if this is kind of a reaction re rather than something that has been long planned out and, and was the goal, um, you know, yeah. the original goal of the company. Yeah, I, I, uh, I fully agree with your breakdown. I mean, I, I love the idea about it. I love the mega trend of quick commerce. I love how food is well positioned like which management also uh, used uh, or emphasized quite a lot uh, today that they are really uniquely positioned if you look at the broad landscape of who are, who are the players uh, within the quick commerce space um, and also because they still be or they believe that, that that the margins going forward will be something that they um, that they still target uh, similar to uh, to the record margins they have had pre previously so so that would be a, like a unique combination uh, with their own product line, their position there. 
but I still feel, feel like my overall impression, I still have to sleep on this, uh, on this earnings call, but my overall impression is still like, okay, we, we had bad Q4 figures, really disappointing. We try to wrap them in with, uh, with talking about a strong year so that it doesn't become, uh, you know, so evident that the Q was, uh, was bad. And then quickly wrapping it up in something, look at where we are heading. Uh, to try to co to also cover uh, some of the really bad things that were in the PNL short term wise. So it's like yeah. I'm a little bit split there because a lot of bad news, but I can't say anything wrong about. Um, I don't know if pivot is the right term, but uh, around how they how they expand because from a value cons cons uh, consumer uh, or customer proposition, this seems like you mentioned as well. It seems like exactly what we love from food and why it is that we. We like uh, investing in food and food as a um, uh, as a as a dominant player in the Canadian market that will that will grow uh, and take a big part of the team. Yeah, um, yeah, I, I agree that I'm gonna need to sleep on it and 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 think about it. I, I haven't like I'm just gonna say I, I didn't go out buying shares today. I'm still holding all of the shares that I owned before. Um, but I kind of wish they didn't um, put such a strong emphasis on the quick commerce, especially because it's so new. But mm -hmm. in the investing community, there is such a skepticism across these quick commerce companies, whether it's DoorDash or Uber or Instacart, Delivery Hero, because no one really can see how these companies are going to achieve profitability. Whereas meal kits themselves have, you know, um, are actually already profitable, right? So, and if you look at HelloFresh and, and their business model, you can see how successful it is. Um, if good food becomes less like HelloFresh and more like Instacart or DoorDash, um, it's a much better value proposition for a customer. But for an investor, I think that um, there's a lot to be worried about. Um, yeah. but you know, yeah, it's, it's, you know, it's remained to be, it's hard to say, right. We need to wait a few quarters and, uh, and management you know, would basically address that. And we're addressing this more or less between lines on this call by saying to the investors that, well, this, we will take all the benefits from a PNL coming out of the meal kit business while delivering first class service to the customers, right? That's basically like the, the, the notion here that you have to buy into because it's own products. It's, it's, um, it's a customer base uh, that you would deliver it to. You have the economies of scale. You would just do it faster and do it more convenient and, and be the first ones there. I think that was yeah. like a big emphasis on being the first one. I don't know if you noticed that part about the, just, just for our uh, viewers to understand. So they launched this, first micro fulfillment center in Toronto, which was serving, I think you mentioned it also like 18 or 20 neighborhoods. Yep. I think Kagi mentioned that, that this, um, this was the equivalent to, he mentioned an X amount of people, how much they were, this one fulfillment center could, uh, could target in Toronto. Do you have that figure with you? I don't, but I know that they said like they're within like minutes of people now. So yeah. Toronto is downtown Toronto is like pretty compact. Like I live here. Um, like I'm only an hour and 20 minute walk from like the very most down downtown part of like the very center core of downtown Toronto. And without traffic, I could drive there in like 10 minutes. So Toronto is pretty small. Mm. Um, yeah, so I assume they're they're quite close. Yeah, and and they mentioned that they were they, they are targeting short term the next five to six was it like so of these micro fulfillment yeah. centers. So there were yeah. of course a lot of questions into Capex as well and so on uh, on the earnings call. And uh, regards, they they really view it as something that's it's now if you have to be a first mover. So Kagi talked about the team working twenty four seven. He said on finding the locations. Which, which was quite interesting to hear how locations was, was such a big issue, right? Around uh, these, uh, um, that, is, that is an even bigger part when in, uh, compared to normal fulfillment centers, that you need to be located mm -hmm. on the exact right spot. And even, I think he mentioned to quote him, if you're just two blocks away, that could be the wrong spot for such a micro fulfillment center. Uh, yeah. 
Yeah, uh, so, some of the positives, I guess, that we can say, because I want to talk about some of the positives of this, because the unit economics are actually probably better than, than you or I or some other investors would have thought. Um, so they said the average uh, quick commerce order are in the values of like 65 to $70 per order. That's mm -hmm. pretty good. And that's, that's better than like, you know, the average Uber Eats or DoorDash order, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess because it is grocery, right? People aren't usually just going to get a couple of things. Um, and there's a direct quote from Ferrari saying that they're already seeing early signs of on-demand that on-demand del uh, delivery will fuel demand for their meal kits and ready-to-eat products, as our merchandising for one hour or less delivery includes all three product lines. So I think that um, people go to make an online order because they need groceries, right? Like a one-hour order. But while while they're browsing, they're also adding things like meal kits and ready-to-eat. Um, which are products that have higher margins for, for good food, right? So they're adding these higher margin um, items as well as just, you know, regular grocery items. And then um, Ferrari also said that they're leveraging the delivery routes of their subscription orders, which are known days in advance, and their shipping costs have been well ahead of their expectations, coming in at below $10 Canadian per order. Um, and that they'll continue to improve that as, you know, volume scales as hopefully more subscribers come back. So the unit economics aren't like terrible right now. Um, at, at least they're ahead of like good food management's expectations. But that also lets you know that like, wow, this is like an early story. Like if this is ahead of their expectations, like they're, they were willing to like lose quite, quite a lot of, uh, you know, cash burn. Uh, to get this quick commerce stuff up and running. So that's another thing to think about too. You know, like they're doing it in Toronto. Maybe it's profitable here in Toronto or not profitable, but you know, these are the unit economics in Toronto. What are they going to be in some other smaller markets if they continue to uh, start doing quick commerce there as well? I think that's your spot on there, Adam. And, um, and I think this is also going back to, if you're investing in food, you really need to pay attention to this part because um I think you and I, when when we've been chatting during during the day, this is really to look at food as a as a VC case. Um, so so something that's more on a very early stage, and where this this also tells me really really clearly and puts another emphasis on the business model is still something they're figuring out. What is the exact business model? So yeah. it's still something that they are developing on. We have seen some effects of this part of the business and this part of the business. And now they are uh, still in the process where they are, um, they're molding how, uh, how, how um, yeah, how the business is. Yeah. And shout out to, to George and DZ who also kind of brought that up in their cases when, when we had them on and, you know, they've, they've been hundred percent right when they said this is still a very early story and, you know, it's going to take some time to watch it play out. I think with that said, I think that we can wrap it up and, uh, you know, kind of uh, recover from, from the painful day. Uh, thank you so much, Jacob. Do you have anything to add? Uh, nothing to add. Likewise, Adam, have a, have a, have a good evening. Yep. Thanks. And uh, thanks to everyone who, who watches our updates. Take care.